Welcome to Let's Talk Tech with NVTC, a digital series exploring tech's most notable trends, new innovations, digital transformations, lean agile principles and mindsets, the future of work and more. We'll introduce next gen leaders from member companies of the Northern Virginia Technology Council and learn about the great impact they are making in our region. I'm your host, Philip Nathrop. Welcome to Let's Talk Tech with NVTC. Today's episode will feature General Dynamics Information Technologies, Amy Gilliland. And as always, we'll have our Did You Know section at the end. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Accenture, American Systems, Consumer Technology Association, General Dynamics Information Technology, ICF, MITRE, TalkDesk, and our media partner, iHeartMedia. You can find all of our episodes on Wonk FM, the iHeartMedia podcast app, and the DC Local Leaders podcast. Now, I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Amy Gilliland. We're going to be discussing Amy's perspective on the government contracting's technology landscape. Please help me welcome Amy Gilliland. Welcome to Let's Talk Tech with NVTC. Thanks, Phil. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to do this right away. I want to ask you how great you feel being a Naval Academy grad watching the game a couple of weeks ago. It was a it was a great win. And more importantly, it was also a great game. So, yeah, we uh, we we had a, a, a lucky outcome for sure. Yeah. Where'd you watch the game? I was at home. We have a watch party usually at my at my house. I have small children, so. We're not up to going to the game just yet. We'll be there in a couple of years, but it was really, really, really fun. Yeah. Now you went to the Naval Academy and I know you also went to Wharton. Where's home for you? Where's home base? Did you grow up around here? Uh, I actually grew up just outside of Baltimore in okay. Ellicott City, Maryland. So I am oh, wow. local. Yes. Yeah. Are you a Ravens fan also? So that's a great question. Actually, when you think about things from your childhood that you remember, I actually remember watching the news with the moving vans that came in the middle of the night to take the Colts out of Baltimore. Yeah. So, so, so traumatized by that. And actually, the Ravens came to Baltimore after I'd kind of moved on to the Navy. And so now I my my better half was born in in red, you know, in the Washington football team footy pajamas. And so now we're full on for the Washington football team, which is a, another team to cheer for, for sure. But, but Navy comes first and foremost. And I, I should tell you when, when I was at the Naval Academy, we actually lost all four years. Yeah. So it was a, a tough run when we're there, always sweet to have a win, but always better to have a really good game. Yeah. Did you grow up in a military family? Why the Naval, Naval Academy? Yeah, it's a good question. I did not grow up in a in a traditionally Navy family. My mom was an Army civilian, and so the military was always around me. And my great grandfather, she was a single parent. And so my great grandfather actually raised me and he emigrated to the U.S. from Switzerland when he was 18, arrived in New York Harbor, Staten Island, and was really a proud American citizen when he got his citizenship. And he actually served in the Navy for a couple of years. So I heard stories from him, but that that pride of being able to serve the country and the responsibility to do so. I also went on a field trip to the Naval Academy when I was in kindergarten. And so I bought the Naval Academy pennant and hung it on the bulletin board in my room and always sort of looked at it. So it was definitely a school that I eyed from afar for a long time. And with all of those influences, it became a focal point for me early on in high school. Yeah. How long, and remind me again, how long you spent in the Navy total? So I was in the Navy just over nine years. Yeah, that's a long time. I mean, when you were when you were transitioning out, did you ever see yourself in a position like you're in now as president of a company like GDIT? You guys have done eight eight billion last year, I think, right? That's right. Yep. Uh, the short answer is no. I I it was a very difficult decision for me to leave the service. I loved my time in the service. It was tremendous. I was afforded all kinds of wonderful opportunities. And from a leadership perspective, you just, you, you can't get those experiences anywhere else. 
And so moving to industry, I knew I wanted to still be close to the military. And I think many veterans struggle in trying to understand how their capabilities and experiences convey. And so if you asked me if I was going to have uh, IT services business unit, uh, no, would have been, no would have been the answer. But I will say, when I was trying to understand how I might fit into industry and interviewing at General Dynamics, one of the things that I'm most proud of to be part of this corporation is very open-minded and giving people a lot of different experiences in their career is something this corporation does well. So I knew I had the opportunity to do different kinds of things here. And that was something that really helped me pick General Dynamics because I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. I'm still not sure I know exactly what I want to do when I grow up, actually. Uh, but I wanted to have the, the freedom and the possibility to do a lot of things. And I've gotten to do just that. Yeah, that's one thing that I've always, you know, I, I love the way that you said that I've, I've over the years, I've become more increasingly grateful for the fact that we're in the area that we're in that Annapolis is right over the right over the bridge, right over, you know, in Route 50. We have access to so many bases around here. There's so many transitioning military folks that I've come in contact with that it's their leadership skills, whether they were the special operators or not. The military just seems to do that really well. Um, and it seems like they treat it as a skill set. It doesn't matter where you start, but where you end off is going to be very different. So it's no secret that you would spend that much time in the military and maybe not interact with IT services, but now find yourself in a position to be incredibly useful to a company like General Dynamics. Yeah, I definitely see that. We're very focused on hiring veterans for all the reasons you just gave. There is also a, a long, longer term focus on the mission. You know, these, they, they understand, uh, veterans understand yeah. how, how the, the mission and our customers think. They also have a values uh, basis and ethos, if you will, that really aligns uh, well with what we focus on here at, at General Dynamics. So, and you know, it's interesting, actually, I think I would have had much more interaction with IT services if it was evolving like it is now. You know, we're talking, I've been at the company 17 years, you know, we're talking a long time ago that I was in the service and even longer ago when I was on uh, destroyers and when I was at sea. And now we understand as technology evolves, the part that it plays in our ships and in really it is the underpinning of warfare now. And so I think I would have been much more exposed now if I was serving than even I was, uh, you know, two decades ago. Yeah. Just all the things we can do with software and technology and maintaining that. And the fact that over the last 25 years, the internet has exploded and allowed us this opportunity to do these things where we can monitor things from space so that the warfighter is kept safer. That's absolutely right. If you think about it, when we were, it used to be that sailors wrote literal letters home and that was before email. And so it was really hard to communicate and you didn't have real time notification of what's going on. And so obviously the life underway on ships and so forth has changed dramatically. You know, I couldn't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, we had radio communications and I know GDIT and General Dynamics at large has done a lot recently with some of those radio uh, communications. I've had the opportunity to see some of that at some recent conventions. Um, but just the way that they were to relay information from the ship to land and to get things done, to make decisions that are critical, um, just we've made so much progress just with information technology. And, and, and so much more progress to make. That is really the focus of the Pentagon now when you think of, you know, they call it JADC2, but really what it is, is being able to leverage all the data points that you have, whether it be on a ship, on the battlefield, on an airplane, from a drone, and be able to aggregate all that data in real time and provide timely, not just data, but timely intelligence, those two are different, to the warfighter is really important. And we're continuing to evolve as a nation and as an industrial complex and as a military and how we do that. Yeah. Well, one of the things that happened last year was 
obviously we had an election and every election the president comes out uh, with their executive order. This time we had a cyber executive order. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's critical is for all of the reasons we were talking about and how it's changing the way that the government hires services, the way that those contractors provide those services to the government. What are some of the things that GDIT is doing specifically to, um, to abide by those outlines, but also to really take things to another level and be effective? Yes, that's a great question. The cyber executive order doubles down on a focus that our customers have had on cybersecurity for a number of years. Cyber itself isn't new, but right. what we have seen over the past 20 months, pandemic, even before the pandemic, but we've been very focused on things like solar winds. And it seems that these uh, malicious or nefarious actors are, are, are perhaps becoming more aggressive. And so what the cyber executive order does is it puts some more elements of what that cyber protection looks like for government networks. And in particular, things like identity credentialing access management or ICAM, zero trust. And the other thing that it does is it enforces the timeline on which agencies need to adopt this. So to answer your question, we have over 3,000 employees that have cyber credentials. So we have a whole community here and we have been able over time to collaborate and, and frankly, to be able to move those cyber specialists around the company to get different experiences. That really helps. But on top of it, we are also delivering on some solutions for customers. And what they're looking for is advice on, on how to go do this quickly proven solutions that we've delivered elsewhere and given the size of this enterprise and the scale at which we're doing it, we have been able to be advisors in that regard. But also you can see their mindset and how they're procuring. So for instance, we have a contract uh, for the Department of Defense for their ICAM or identity credentialing access, how, how you give people access within the enterprise and just to give you a sense, it has really changed how government contracting is. This was a OTA or other transactional authority. You live around these spaces, but in, it's a very quick procurement, right? And we had uh, 45 days to deliver a prototype. Once it was awarded, we went to our Emerge Lab and did that. And we had to continue to iterate in sprints with what the customer's needs were. Now we can foray that ICAM solution across the Department of Defense and frankly, across our enterprise to help other customers who are trying to figure out how to do this the right way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what, what's, what's the idea of becoming more agile, building it as you go, right? Like it's in the past, you're right. They would, they would, issue, they would issue a requisition or an order, you would agree to do it. And then what, nine, 10, 12 months later, you'd show up with something that hopefully worked? Is that, I mean? That's exactly it. If you think about that timeline, 20 months ago, digital modernization roadmaps looked like 24, 2025, 2026. Yeah. And look what we were able to do in the pandemic, just in terms of allowing people to work securely remotely. As an enterprise for us, we had to figure out over a weekend how to do that. And so I think we've figured out that we can do things faster. And we also know that technology because it has to, is evolving more quickly. And so these 20 month timelines that you described of get in there, understand the road, they change so quickly that the agile approach is really much more effective for industry and for our customers alike. Well, I think, yeah, for the agencies, because by the time you build what they've asked you to build, they've already found different needs to use something else that they, it's already obsolete by the time you've already provided it to them. Uh, Absolutely and right. And now you guys have the opportunity in particular to be there along the way, adapt along the way, give them exactly what they need. Um, and then also for that next, for the next iteration, you're already ahead of the, the curve because you know what to do. You know what didn't work, but you know it's something that they have that's useful. That's right. So you end up with a better solution, frankly, even a more cost-efficient solution, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. So, you know, with that, I know that GDIT has done a number of acquisitions. CSRA is the most recent one I can think of, but I'm sure that there was many. Given the executive order and where GDIT wants to go as a company, where are you guys investing? Where, what's the new technology that you're looking at or the new opportunities to help grow GDIT to make you better, to better serve our government? 
I think it's clear. I, I would say we're investing, obviously, in technology. So when you look at the digital modernization roadmaps, really, we have to go where our customer needs. Our, our investments are driven by their requirements. And when we look on the horizon, at least today, and this will change, but today they are focused on cyber and cloud and artificial intelligence and machine learning and those sorts of, of places. And so, yes, we as a company have experiences, but we are looking to leverage partnerships that we have with technology companies to figure out that the next iteration of these capabilities, because as a systems integrator, we are helping to pair those technologies that are on the come to solve problems that are our customer's environment. But I want to answer your question a different way, because those kinds of investments are really table stakes, and it is incumbent upon us as a company to understand where the puck is moving and to make sure that we are investing in those partnerships and those technologies appropriately. And, and we're doing all of those things. But what we really have to do now, Phil, is invest in our people. And that is a huge focus because if you have the technologies that are out there, but your employee population doesn't have the skill set or experience to deliver those technologies, then you have a problem as a business. And so our employees are very interested in continuing to evolve their own skill sets, which is important from a career development and retention standpoint. But as I look at bids and opportunities that are out there to help our customers, either on contracts that we're serving on or new contracts that are out there, it is the skill set of our employees that is really important. And so that is an investment that the company is looking at. And you get there a variety of ways. One of them is through internal mobility, moving people around so they have different experiences in different customer sets and with different kinds of technologies but also through technical certifications and making sure we have these great partnerships with our technology companies. They do trainings as a result of those partnerships and making sure we're leveraging all those opportunities and providing our employees courses that they can take that have the latest skills to really help them evolve their skill set, but really also an investment in our customer as well. Yeah, so you're investing in yourself which you know, is the best investment you can make, especially as an individual, but probably even more so as a company. The people yeah, that We are investing for... in, our, in our people, which in turn is an investment in our company and also in our customer and the requirements. And so that, the thing about the technical certifications is they're not stagnant. They're very dynamic. Right. And so we have to, to keep pace with that and provide employees opportunities and a roadmap, because as you understand, for, for you and I, we all want to continue to learn and evolve in our careers, but you can get really fixated on what you're doing right now. And our customers in particular are looking at, at, looking at us to not just deliver what we said we're going to do, but also to help them as they think about the future, and particularly in this budget environment. So, making sure that we're injecting these new kinds of technology and skill sets into our employees as they're delivering for our customers today is imperative. And I think when we, when we look at investments from a business perspective, that is certainly the, the most important among them. Yeah. I mean, the, the term great reassessment, right? The great resignation, these are terms we hear. And it sounds like that's the, the best way that most companies have found to go about it. Uh, it's not just attracting a talent, it's retaining talent. And with that, it sounds like retraining is something that you guys want to do or exposing them to different environments or a diversity of thought that they may not have been exposed to. If they were siloed in this one area, they think a certain way. And if everybody's using a chainsaw, but you need a screwdriver, you kind of have a problem. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. That Actually, I think there's a couple of pieces I was listening to, I'm a avid listener of your podcast. So a couple of weeks ago, you had somebody on and, and she was talking about the, the long game. Employees' careers are the long game. And that's how we, I, I couldn't have agreed with her more. And part of that is showing employees that you're thinking about them, not just for the job that you're doing today, but for the long game. And if they see that you are investing in them and helping them move along in their careers, that is uh, definitely a strong 
retention tool. We see that also, but I think it's more than that too. It is also in, in the backdrop of the great reassessment. People, and you've said this, I think you said, you know, you want to work with people that you know, that you like, and that you trust. And building a company where you work with people that you know, that you like, and that you trust is is really, the it resonated with me because that's the heart of what we're trying to do here. Building that community is a lot of different things. In addition to the internal mobility opportunities and the tech certifications, we're also working on being a place where people can come together with, with shared concerns or interests. Employee resource groups are really big part of what we do here. So we want to create a place that is enjoyable and more than just a transaction. And that is the kind of the kind of culture that I'm I'm really proud proud we have here. You know, the other thing about the great reassessment, particularly as we're thinking about um, Omicron coming out and just just people are really tired and struggling. And we've been talking about mental health a lot here. So providing employees resources from their company that help them get through things that they're struggling with in their personal lives can really help them at work and allows us to continue to serve our customers. So there's a lot that goes into the equation of, of how you help employees succeed yeah. in their careers. Yeah. The human condition is so like, that's, that's mostly what I focus my attention on. And you said a lot of things, those are my taglines, right? No like, and trust. And that's who, that's who we do business with. It's who we want to do work with. It's who we want to be around. And when we think of leadership, someone can see themselves in you and in your experiences. Someone can look at you and see that you're someone that they, they want to emulate and that they hope that they can aspire to. And you're not unattainable, um, you know, because we create, yeah, like you said, like, you know, that's human, human interactions over transactions, right? I think that once we do more of that, I talk about that on every platform. I've got my own, everything that I do. Uh, that's a big deal. And to see a company take that on and create those environments doesn't mean that you're going to be best friends with everyone. But, you know, know, like, and trust is something that can happen. I, there's people that I know, like, and trust that I don't really even see that often. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I know them, I like them, and I trust them. There's even people that I don't really know, but I like and I trust. And I probably would take their advice on things. Um, but it's having that dynamic of people where, they have the, if you want what they have, do what they do. They have experience that you can learn from. And if you want to be where they are, get in their pocket and get lost. Make that person a mentor. And I know that GDIT, you guys have just done um, a WIT, Women in Tech seminar. I see a lot of the great things that you guys are doing just as a community within your own organization. Um, you know, Mike Baker's pretty vocal. You know, I know, I know a lot of people, maybe I'm partial because I know a lot of people over there. Um, we have, a, we have a fantastic team, and I couldn't agree with you more about being able to see yourself in, in the company. And we really do focus on that, whether it is through our veterans mentoring groups or, or what, whatever it is, the, the types of folks, that, that kind of environment where people feel like they can come and be a part and that they are valued as people reassess in the aftermath of the pandemic, money always matters, but you want to spend your time in a place where you feel like you add value and you are appreciated and that you continue to evolve. And that's what we're trying to build here in all the different ways that I suggested. And as you have highlighted, you know, a number of our leaders, and I think they epitomize those things and we want them to be the example for all of the leaders that are coming up in uh, in our company. That is the kind of company we want to be. And frankly, that is how you recruit. We have a great friends and family program here. Lots of referrals. Best way to attract talent is for people to say, it's fun to work here. People care. And uh, these are folks you want to be with. Yeah. The best business to get is a referral business. And uh, absolutely. Are- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best marketing you could do is doing a great job. And if you've got your employees talking about how great it is to work there, you're not going to have to worry about attracting talent. Uh, And then retaining talent sounds like you guys are doing a lot to retrain them, to keep them up to date with what they need to do. You know, and and knowing that you guys hire the transitioning military folks is, I think, a huge thing, especially the special operations. They tend to be the quiet operation, the the, the quiet professionals. Um, And they have the leadership skills that, Companies need, companies like yours need, maybe they don't have the certifications, but they don't need that. You guys will help them get that. 
Yeah, and I, I just want to add one fine point onto that because it's one helping veterans find how they fit into a company is number one in terms of recruiting them, but helping them transition once they're here is also a real focal point for us. And so I described the the mentoring programs. I went through that phase personally, and I can tell you if you spent five years, a decade, two decades, however long you've spent in the military, it's an experience and coming to the outside world is a different experience. And so we are really focused on that period to help veterans connect with other veterans, connect with the business and understand quickly how they can become a part. And that certainly helps in the longevity of their careers with the company. And so we're finding great success. And I'm very proud of our focus on on veterans and frankly, for all that they do for our company, they're tremendous employees. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. Well. I really appreciate you being here and sharing everything with us. Well, thank you so much. I'm such a fan of yours and I appreciate your focus on people. It really resonates in the spirit of the community here that we are so fortunate to be a part of. So thanks for including me. And don't forget to stick around for Did You Know? Before we go, let's talk about Did You Know? Did you know GDIT increased their veteran hiring by more than 200% in 2021? In fact, they hire a new GDIT -er every hour. GDIT employees complete more than 175,000 learning hours in critical technical areas such as cloud, AI, and cyber. More than half of GDIT employees maintain security clearances, enabling GDIT to support a broad range of classified agency programs. We hope you've enjoyed today's program and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Be sure to visit nvtc.org for more information. We look forward to seeing you at next month's Let's Talk Tech with NVTC. In the meantime, follow us at Nova Tech Council on Twitter and LinkedIn. And remember to sign up for the latest tech news at nvtc.org. <laughs>